Greetings to everyone. On behalf of the Hatch Consortium Board of Directors, I would like to welcome you to our 2024 Best Practices Showcase to celebrate technology, innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Camille, and I will be presenting the speakers for the concurrent sessions of this room. Before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruption. This session is being recorded. This presentation will be in English. Finally, our staff will pass the QR code to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation for this session before you leave the room. You can also find the QR code on your name badge. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to heads. Now, we are ready to start. This current section is on the track. The title of the presentation is The Narratives Around High-Speed Rail and AI Analysis. And our speakers are Catherine Escalante and Christian Leves. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christian Deres. My name is Catherine Escalante. And we're both undergraduate students at Eastern Connecticut State University. And today we're excited to present our research on narratives around high-speed rail in the United States. This is an AI-powered assistant. Um, yeah, so our goal with our research is essentially to build upon traditional qualitative research methods using artificial intelligence. So we're going to take a traditionally uh, social science research method and integrate artificial intelligence into the process. So throughout our research presentation, we will emphasize the implications of our methodology for higher ed fields and for undergraduate research. So here is a brief overview of what we will be covering today. So just to continue on what Catherine said, we will be expanding the concept of bridging the gap between social research and te the emerging technology that is AI. And that, next, we're going to uh, introduce the research questions that help guide our analysis. Yeah, then we'll pivot into a quick overview and background of high-speed rail. We're going to discuss um, how it began, its state in the United States, and then we're going to use that knowledge to catapult us into our research methods, um, how we were able to analyze uh, research literature using artificial intelligence, and what it can tell us about the current state of high-speed rail in the United States. Then we're going to go into our results, recommendations, and of course, our limitations. So starting off with the, this concept of bridging the gap. So I was lucky enough to take a course called Digital History at Eastern in my sophomore year. And this class uh, really invigorated an interdisciplinary spirit in me, I suppose. Um, this class allowed me to look at uh, historical stories, manuscripts, and uh, data and analyze them through the lens of technology. So we did things like trace historical immigration trends using Microsoft Excel. We were able to make things like data visualizations. We were able to geocode how different immigrant populations moved about uh, the state of Connecticut. And I was really excited because this was the first time I ever stepped out of my social science bubble and ventured into technology. And I was really excited to be able to apply this to my home field, which was political science. Um, so we all know that AI analysis allows um, us to look at things at an unprecedented rate. Um, and we believe um, with a strong conviction that social scientists need to start leveraging artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies in order to solve social problems at unprecedented rates, more efficiently, and at more scalable paces. These are our research questions. So the first one we've already been discussing a little bit. So how can AI be integrated into social science research? The next one is what narratives around high-speed rail impact public perception and its implementation? And then lastly, how can AI inform and support equity goals in development and implementation of high-speed rail policy? So that last piece we haven't touched on a lot quite yet. But as we started doing our research, we were really interested in uh, seeing how um, high-speed rail specifically affects Latino communities in places like California, for example. Um, and we actually ran into an, uh, an over-representation of negative effects when it comes to Latino populations um, in relation to high-speed rail. 
So we were wondering how can we use artificial intelligence to start beginning um, to craft different frameworks to support equity goals when it comes to applying um, and implementing things like high-speed rail. <clears throat> so um, I, we're gonna give a quick overview on high-speed rail in general, of course. Um, so high-speed rail was introduced for the first time in 1964 in Japan. And ever since, it has been adopted globally by countries like Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, and France. Um, and when we really start to look at it, it's no wonder why. High-speed rail is characterized by being operational at staggering speeds of 124 miles per hour, which is an insane number by itself, but especially so when you consider that normal passenger trains only travel at about 60 miles per hour. That's why high-speed rail is considered to be one of the most sustainable transportation systems available to us in the modern day. It's able to cut greenhouse gas emissions, it's able to cut carbon emissions, it's able to decrease traffic congestion, it's able to uh, decrease travel times uh, by over half in most of the cities that it's being implemented in. So I want us all to look at these four pictures. As people who grew up in America, um, or at least maybe some of you have close proximity to um, this kind of scenario, we're all familiar with what this looks like, right? We know what traffic congestion feels like, we know what unwalkable spaces look like, we know what unkept sidewalks look like, um, and seemingly many of the benefits of high-speed rail could address some of the shortfalls that we see in current U.S. infrastructure. So we had the question, why is high-speed rail not as relevant in the U.S. conversations as it is with our contemporaries abroad? So just to put the focus on the U.S. and the state of high-speed rail in, in the country. Um, so the first high-speed rail project was in the U.S. It connects um, between Washington, D.C. and New York City. Um, and Currently, well, as of 2018, there have been 1,720 proposals approved, but yet not yet started in the United States. Additionally, only 33 miles of high-speed rail have been built as of 2018. So, <clears throat> the, the state of high-speed rail in the United States <coughs> seems like there's a lot of um, wanting for it, but not a lot of action has actually been taking place to construct it. Yeah, so now that we kind of understand the background of high-speed rail and how it's currently functioning in the U.S., uh, we want to introduce our research method. So at the beginning of this presentation, we noted that we're going to be building upon this qualitative research method. So um, in the social sciences, uh, one research, qualitative research method is called discourse analysis. And discourse analysis is essentially just a method of studying language. It posits that language is not only just about conveying information, but that it can impress, express things like social relations, power relations, identities, and cultural values. Um, it also posits that discourse analysis can help identify the factors that lead to something's success or failure, which is imperative and key to our research. We're gonna try and analyze high-speed rail literature and policy um, and its language in order to see why it's uh, succeeding or why it's failing in the United States ecosystem. Um, another aspect of this is public opinion. We know that language shapes public opinion. If something has a really negative uh, language being attached to it, most people are gonna have a bad public perception of that. So we wanna see how those narratives and that language is affecting public perception and what we can do about that in relation to high-speed rail. So we're going to start off with our first methodology that we use. We're going to give a little uh, brief interview of the a uh, of AI language models, um, what went into our GPT building, and then lastly, um, but very important, prompt engineering. So just for a quick overview of AI, um, specifically natural language processing, which is the technology behind um, ChatGPT. Um, it's it's, it's what allows machines to understand human language, digest it, analyze it. Um, like when you give it a prompt, it understands what you're saying, and then it goes and executes that prompt and returns it in human language English. Um, 
So some examples are chatbots like ChatGPT or maybe a company's uh, like virtual assistant customer service thing, um, or speech recognition bots like Siri or Alexa. Yeah, so to add on to that, um, earlier we talked about using discourse analysis, which studies language. We thought that it is, um, it is most equipped, AI is most equipped at natural language processing, at interpreting language. So it makes sense that we build upon a qualitative research method that is literally based in assessing language with the tool that is most equipped currently to look at that language and interpret it. So we're marrying the two um, together to see what happens. So now let's go into GPTs. So we are familiar with ChatGPT, but um, the creators of ChatGPT, OpenAI, have allowed um, its users to, or at least its premium users, to create GPTs, which are basically just a specialized version of a chat GPT. So these on the screen are ones created by OpenAI. So if you see there's one like Laundry Buddy, you can specialize and just uh, have answering any questions relating to doing your laundry or math mentor or sous chef, which uh, helps you in math and or creating recipes based on your taste or ingredients you have available to you. Um, so we use um, this feature that OpenAI made available and we're like, okay, let's use it to um, specialize in high-speed rail and everything surrounding it so you can chat with it about the specialized topic. Yeah, so as Christian was saying, ChatGPT is basically trained on the open internet, right? So um, when you type a prompt into your little chat box, it's pulling from the depths of the internet. And you have no way to verify that data, you have no way to kind of create checks and balances for the answers that you're getting. But GPTs allow you to specifically cater that data to your purposes and to create specific tasks out of that. So one of the most important things to us was creating high quality data to feed um, our GPT with. So we had 20 data sets. Um, that's what we have to call them. They're just basically academic literature, congressional hearings, assessments, articles, and policy um, relating to high speed rail. Um, so our data sets were ranging from seven pages to about 169 pages. We had like a full length book in there um, and we use this data to train our high speed rail and we had to give it a description a task um, uh, it's a task analyzer so we had to tell it what to do what kind of system it is um, and our uh, ultimate system was essentially a high speed rail policy analyst so now to a very crucial aspect of our work prompt engineering which uh, if you've ever used ChatGPT, you're essentially doing it. It's crafting your prompt to maximize the best result you can get from the ChatGPT, um, which is very important because it, it, your the ChatGPT is only as good as the prompt you enter in. Its response depends a lot on the user. Yeah. So um, because our model isn't trained on things like. Um, equity frameworks or even discourse analysis techniques, the brunt of the labor for us was creating good prompts um, that would be able to achieve the same level of analysis um, for an AI as a human. So a lot of the work went into having very specific language and these prompts be able to get us to our end goal, which was conducting discourse analysis. Um, what's interesting is that uh, companies like OpenAI, the thing behind ChatGPT, are actually um, hiring philosophers in order to lead their developing teams um, in prompt engineering because philosophy majors have a really uh, intense understanding of how language functions and how sentences function. And that's really good for two reasons. One, we're seeing social sciences and technology already meshed together in the private sector but also as a philosophy major, I finally have job prospects. Um, so we're really happy about that. <coughs> so this is the first prompt we threw at our GPT. Um, we noticed that through the documents we fed it, there wasn't a, it was kind of hard to sort of decipher through all the text what a clear cut sort of timeline of the major events in the development and implementation of high speed rail happening in the United States. 
So we gave that task to our uh, GPT model and see what it can kind of come up with um, since 1980. Yeah, so this was the high speed rail timeline that our GPT model was able to generate. Uh, we think this is probably one of our most impressive results because although we read all 20 data sets, uh, ranging from 7 to 170 some pages, we were still really unclear of what the timeline of high speed rail actually looked like. Um, high speed rail is one of those policies that's been starting and stopping um, since the idea has been around in the United States. So being able to visualize what this timeline has actually looked like through the policies that made changes happen was revolutionary to our personal understanding. So we see how in 1991, um, ITSA was passed for the first time, which shipped away the barriers that allowed the implementation of the United States' first high-speed rail project in 2000 um, with the Acela line, which we talked about earlier, uh, connecting Washington, T Washington DC to New York City, Great line, by the way, highly recommend that one. Um, and then we also see huge investments in 2009, um, and with $8 billion being invested into high-speed rail, leading to huge high-speed rail expansion, relatively, um, from 2010 to 2018. Um, but we also see how that's had a lot of mixed success. We see certain players um, come about, like California and Florida, um, becoming very uh, large players when it comes to high-speed rail and being eager to top things like federal funds um, in relation to high-speed rail to fund their own projects. And then we also see the COVID-19 impact um, where in COVID-19, um, uh, you know, the world shut down. So there was a lot of delays, a lot of reassessments, a lot of budget allocations that had to completely change, uh, which kind of transformed the narrative of high-speed rail. And the latest updates we have with High Speed Rail um, is we have a new bipartisan plan um, that puts uh, $66 billion into rail investments and $16 billion into um, the Metro Liner line that we've talked about, the Acela line, um, which funds uh, High Speed Rail. Yeah, so the second problem we'll talk about today is um, this one, which is we asked it to based off the tax documents it has um, to kind of tell us what the key economic drivers are that have influenced the formulation and implementation of high-speed rail in the U.S. And this was important because we wanted to analyze the, narr or the narratives, right, and do that discourse analysis using AI. So the brunt of our discourse analysis here was um, in understanding the positive and negative narratives surrounding high-speed rail. So there were three main narratives throughout every single um, uh, piece of data that we were able to feed our GPT model, and the following are the standouts. Firstly, uh, job creation and diversification is the largest narrative um, by far when it comes to high-speed rail. Almost every single piece of literature that we inputted talked about this in some way or another, and it essentially posited that high-speed rail has the possibility to transform economies by supporting new and existing industries. Essentially, you're getting construction workers in there to build high-speed rail. You're employing um, you know, urban planners to go in and uh, transform what used to be roads into something else. Um, you're getting uh, a ton of diversification through that as well, so that was also a large component to that. Um, the second largest narrative we had is environmental benefits. Since we've kind of discussed how high-speed rail is a sustainable transportation system, um, that's definitely one of the large narratives in uh, the research. So we see things like uh, high-speed rail being framed as an alternative to air and car travel. Um, and then we also see different uh, calculus, like um, the ability for high-speed rail to reduce pollution and also the ability to reduce long-term healthcare costs um, in places that have things like high carbon emissions that lead to like higher rates of air particulate matter and stuff like that. And then lastly, we have regional development and urban renewal. So this happens more in cases where you have two regions being connected by high speed rail. Um, and then you have this idea that high speed rail is gonna stimulate regional development by um, encouraging more like of a cross cultural and cross uh, economy kind of interlinking between two regions and two different economies. Now just to move to the flip side, to the negative framing. <clears throat> so first is the cost on the individual, 
so the taxpayer owed tax money that would go into funding such as expensive alternative like high speed rail. Um, next would be the, another major framing, negative framing is the institutional cost of the government, um, government funding through subsidies or grants um, and, and such. And then lastly, the political will. So people don't believe that the government is willing or able and or able to pull off a project like high speed rail in the United States. Yeah, so we want to talk about the implications of our methodology for um, higher education research. Um, so firstly, we believe that uh, this methodology has the power to um, enhance things like our literature reviews. Um, like we mentioned earlier, we read all of these 20 documents that we inputted and we ourselves couldn't discern, you know, off the top of our heads what that high-speed rail timeline looked like. But once we were able to create a prompt that would be able to fill in those gaps for us, um, we were able to understand how the U.S. has developed within the context of high-speed rail so much better. And we believe that using artificial intelligence to um, inform and support our traditional literature reviews can highlight new perspectives um, and highlight new avenues of research. We also believe that the historical research field could also really be revolutionized. A lot of times in history, uh, one person finds one narrative and we kind of stick to it, but being able to analyze and have artificial uh, intelligence provide new perspectives can also provide another avenue for um, us to systematically analyze uh, historical documents and get new insights. Um, another aspect is stakeholder engagement and public opinion analysis. Some of our research uh, was embedded in that and trying to find out what the public thought about high-speed rail and we can certainly see uh, a use in being able to do that with things like tweets for example like making a GPT of just tweets under um, someone's uh, you know tweet about some policy and being able to kind of gauge a public opinion and reaction off that. And also just being able to train our social science students to be tech literate in a time where that is going to be the most essential skill set for their future career. And on the other end of that, being able to train our tech students to care and be invested in uh, solving social problems with the new technological innovations that they are most knowledgeable. So now for the second part of our methodology, which involves fine tuning. So this is a different type of um, sort of AI model we're using. Um, and we're using it to then uh, to conduct equity uh, analysis of certain situations regarding transportation. And then lastly, we're kind of talk about the assigning role to the system so just a quick overview of what fine-tuning is. So fine-tuning is you have the general model, the GPT, and then with fine-tuning, it's similar to what we did with the GPT, but with fine-tuning, it's more of a um, training it to, you can train it, it's like special use cases, like training it to talk in a certain way, or training it to conduct certain sort of um, analysis and um, even have like certain behaviors um, and patterns and its responses. So this is just like how you um, tell it what to do. So you give it a system, uh, tell it what it is. So in this one, it's saying Mars is a fact factual chatbot that is also sarcastic. So that's telling the chat what or the AI model what it is. And then the user is telling um, would be like your prompt. So you're asking it what's the capital of France, and then. So then it would spit out, okay, um, Paris, as if everyone doesn't know that already. That's it. Yeah, so. Yeah, so um, we wanted to basically use that fine tuning and have it um, be able to complete a specific task for us. Uh, we wanted to be able to conduct equity analysis on a certain scenario and be able to problem solve. Um, how to essentially navigate this scenario in the most equitable way possible. So in order to do this, we had to do a ton of scenario building. So as Christian showed us, we had to do uh, 10 uh, different role system inputs and outputs, or inputs, forgive me, 
um, where we essentially took uh, four of the premier frameworks and best practices for equity and sustainable transportation systems and created uh, 10 scenarios off them to be able to train our model. We wanted it to know uh, what the best practices are for equity and how to navigate certain equity failings. So we had to brainstorm an equity failing um, in the context of high-speed rail and then solve it with the information provided by best practice frameworks um, that we found um, through uh, the Department of Transportation and a couple other like uh, nonprofit groups that work to advance equity. Um, so yeah, that was our um, equity training through fine tuning. Um, so we were able to essentially apply these fake scenarios and those fake solutions to create something that would be able to solve a real equity problem. So this, the following is a um, equity problem laid out by a mayor of a town called Vasco in California, a majorly Latino population. Um, yeah, so there's just a rail route that was forced to be abandoned in the town, and this had some negative consequences, like the abandonment of these buildings had led to a lot of um, gang activity running out through the, these abandoned buildings, um, as well as like other things. So people are demanding uh, like the demolition of these things, uh, of these abandoned infrastructure, to be conducted as as it's leading to negative outcomes. Um, so this is what uh, the fine-tuning model looks like on our end of things. So on this side, you see the system, and we trained it on a prompt that says, you are an expert on best practices for transportation equity. You have been asked to consult on a real-life equity failing. Your answer should be detailed and knowledgeable of existing transportation equity frameworks and best practices, and responses should be contextual to each scenario. So we fed it the previous prompt, um, that detailed the situation going on in Wasco, and um, we were able to uh, derive the following results. Um, so this was uh, the final result that our fine-tuned model came up with. Um, it noted that in this scenario, um, the uh, um, distribution of burdens and benefits in this community, community was disproportionate, and um, it asserted that investing in community stabilization methods and providing financial assistance um, would help mitigate that undue uh, burden that the Wasco community was facing due to um, a high-speed rail project and the consequences of such project. Um, and in this specific case, uh, being trained on equity best practices, um, our AI model suggested that um, in this case, the rail authority um, must address the issues of blight and safety caused by the abandoned housing complex and move uh, to provide financial support um, for the demolition of the old complex. Um, so you kind of see how there was a clear result at the end of this specific um, scenario. You kind of have the recommendation of what Wasco should do in order to move forward in an equitable fashion. So now for some recommendations, so DALI, which is one of the more popular, or probably the most popular um, AI image generation technology. Um, so you can use, uh, leverage that to um, sort of create a picture for what some text is maybe trying to display. Um, this is actually AI generated, this infographic looking thing on the right here. Um, it doesn't actually say like anything, but it looks like an infographic about high speed rail. Um, so those things can help to uh, spread information about maybe research or just anything that's a lot of things but needs to be summarized into one, one image uh, can help. Yeah, um, so um, with Dolly specifically, um, a lot of things are happening on the back end of Dolly that don't allow it to um, have text be incredibly legible. So here we asked it to create a infographic of high speed rail that details perhaps the benefits of it for like a brochure, for example. Um, and it was able to create the image quite well, but it wasn't able to actually like use the information that we input it uh, input into it to create sentences that made sense. So if you look at it closely, it's just gibberish. But there are code solutions to that, um, and we do plan on expanding this project, so we would definitely recommend having a more visual component. 
um, especially because there's a lot of storytelling elements that we would ideally want to tap into. Um, so we definitely think that Dolly should be used in similar uh, research. Uh, we also think that um, there should be more scenarios to train equity um, fine tuning. We only use 10 scenarios because it was a, quite a laborious process um, to kind of go through best practices and make sure that everything we were inputting was uh, the most sound that it could be. Um, so we would encourage up to like 20 uh, scenarios so that our AI is most equipped to actually tackle these challenges. Um, and then we would also want to explore more dimensions. This is qualitative research, of course. So we want to do things like track linguistic patterns in policy and see if we can get a more quantitative approach to it and see how um, AI can be integrated to that. Um, and then uh, the final aspect is uh, GPT and fine-tuning integration. Uh, we want to see more social research that uses uh, things like GPT building and fine-tuning and such. Um, so we just thought we should pop it in there. Yeah, just for um, one recommendation I can think of right now for like higher education would be like a teaching, almost like a teaching assistant or like a professor's offer office hours of like the professor's away like upload your syllabus, upload the rubrics to all your assignments so if the uh, student has like any questions about um, your class or an assignment, you can just consult the, the model and um, you know, it, it, it works, it could work out for both parties. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to zoom past the model limitations super quick because I think we have a minute left. Um, so GPT is the dumbest, or AI is the dumbest it's ever going to get, um, which is scary because it's already so advanced. Um, so although we trained it on the latest model, in a couple months that's not going to be the latest model. In a couple months we'll have to redo this research with better results, with better technology. Um, so we have that limitation. The next limitation is on GPT you can only use 20 articles. Um, so that's what we were able to train our model on, but ideally we would love to train on you know, up to 50, 60, 70, 80 articles that we can assure are, you know, up to our, you know, uh, academic standards, of course. Um, Next time frame. So with the constant uh, changing landscape of what's the most up-to-date model, uh, we did have like an, an analysis made already of this, but then that became a legacy model. So we had to use the new model to do this research again. So this, this analysis was done in over just like two months. Um, and then cost, um, the cost wasn't too much for to conduct this project. It was $20 for the GPT premium. And then like, I think we spent like just over a dollar for the fine tuning, but that's just because um, we didn't have that many examples. But fine tuning is notoriously known for being really expensive um, because a lot of people <coughs> Thank you so much for being here and listening to us. Um, yeah, I think we're open to questions. Thank you for your presentation. Now we are ready for the Q&A session. Also, our staff will pass the QR code to help you access the form to evaluate the session before you go. Or you can use the QR code at your batch. Um, the evaluation is anonymous and only takes a few minutes. If you are able to access it from your phone, Please request and complete the printed version of the evaluation. For those who have questions, please say your name and institution before asking them. Any questions? So first off, I want to give you a round of applause. I have two questions. Uh, the first thing uh, is, uh, you know, these AI models are, are sort of notorious for hallucinations. What, what are the types of hallucinations that y'all had to deal with with your analysis, and, and how did y'all work through those? Yeah, I think with our initial legacy model, um, we faced a ton of hallucinations. We were trying to work through how to use this technology. Um, I'm definitely not trained in AI. Uh, Christian took a class in AI, um, but it wasn't very extensive. Um, so a lot of that first like initial um, challenge was <coughs> being able to discern um, what 
it was telling us and um, how we could be able to work through situations where it wasn't telling us the uh, most factual thing. So at first, when we started using the first legacy model, we hadn't read through all 20 um, of our research articles. We had read through most of them, but we were like, oh, AI could probably do the brunt of this work. Uh, we quickly found out that we had no way to be able to fact check anything of what our AI was saying. So taking the time um, after a preliminary legacy model research to actually go through and make sure that we understood the takeaways and also the specifics of all 20 pieces of uh, literature that we put into our GPT model was crucial to that. In terms of prompt engineering, I think it's really difficult to troubleshoot things like hallucinations, um, but once you have a understanding of the text itself and can also uh, use like discourse analysis techniques to mitigate those things, um, you can start having a better understanding and get to a better place with your results um, and feel that your results are good faith. So to be clear, your, your legacy model was worth using 3.5, I'm assuming, and then you moved to 4? Da Vinci. Yeah, it was actually an older model. Okay, so yeah. you were using Da Vinci, and then you went from that to 4, or did you do 3.5? Uh, so I believe um, GPT-4 is only available, I think it's only available in beta testing right now. So we use 3.5 turbo Because 4 is available in beta. Did you copy a lot? Oh, well, for fine tuning. Yeah. We use the 3.5 turbo instinct, but for the, the GPT, yes, we used four. Okay. And then the only other thing I'll say is your recommendation about creating a, a bot to help. I'm doing that. I've created one for my class, and I'm tuning it right now. That's incredible. And getting it ready. It's called Biz GPT, is what I've named it. And it's for my small business courses. So I'll, I'll be releasing it probably in the summer is when, when the marketplace is open and all that. Maybe yeah. like they opened it a day ago. Yeah, they opened it a day ago, but I'm not ready. Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah. still working on it, and so, uh, but I'll be releasing it for my, my students. Uh, That's so, amazing. Yeah, I, I, I was looking at the GPT store yesterday, and I noticed that the top GPTs are all like policy and like, or no, research assistants. Right. So I, it definitely seems like a lot of people are, like there's a strong demand and for um, using AI to assist with research. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you for your participation in this session and for sharing your feedback. Your recommendations are very important to us.